All right, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to our session today on the impact of leadership on education. My name is Hiba Abbasi, and I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the University of Manchester Middle East Center team. Before we start the session, I would like to uh, start by briefly introducing the University of Manchester, which is the largest campus-based university in the UK with strategic partnerships and collaborations worldwide. For more than 25 years, the university has been forging strong global partnerships and collaborations across four continents, and namely in uh, Manchester, Manchester is where the campus is, but in Hong Kong, Singapore, Shanghai, Brazil, and Dubai. The Middle East Center was founded in 2006 to offer the part-time global MBA program. And in, to offer the part-time global MBA program for working professionals. In 2017, we started operating as the University of Manchester Middle East Center, and we have expanded our offerings and our master's program to include, in addition to the MBA program, other specialist master's programs, such as the master's in education and leadership in practice, master's in real estate and financial management, and we have other exciting programs that are coming up very soon. Our center, the Middle East Center, supports more than 2,900 students who are all working professionals and come from 100 nationalities. And we have graduated approximately or more than uh, 1,900 alumni who are also working professionals. We have also developed a regional alumni community of approximately 5,000 alumni who have studied in Manchester, but they live and work in this region, in the Middle East and in the GCC region. Today's session is, uh, is really interesting because we're going to talk about the role of leaders in the education sector, namely in schools and universities. We're going to discuss um, the role of these leaders in managing change, in coping with change, how do they adapt and how do they respond to circumstances and how they manage, uh, how they manage digital transformation in the past year, in addition to other topics. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers for this session. We we'll start here in this room. I would like to introduce Nilay Ozral, who is the CEO of Bloom Education. Welcome, Nilay. Nada Meseki is the Associate Vice Provost for Research Administration and Financial Planning at New York University, Abu Dhabi. And joining us online, we have Barat Mansukhani, who is the CEO of ISP or International Schools Partnerships for the Middle East and Europe Division, and our moderator for today's session and our alumni, Cameron Robert Cardan, who's the founder and chief executive officer at Knowledge E. So without further ado, I would like to pass it on to you, Cameron, and I'd like to welcome you all and start the session. Thank you, thank you very much, Heba, and a big welcome to all the participants of the sessions today. And a big thank you to my fellow panelists, uh, Barat, Nilay, and Neda. Uh, just a brief introduction from my side. My name is Cameron Cardan. I'm the CEO and founder of Knowledge E, a company established uh, close to 10 years ago. And yes, I am one of the 1,900 alumni that uh, Heba was mentioned. Uh, and I had the pleasure to go through the global MBA program with University of Manchester. So as a CEO of Knowledge, we're a company uh, working on a mission of moving towards a more knowledgeable world. And we provide content, technology, capacity building to academia and, and research. So working very closely with universities and the schools in the region. So uh, as you know, the topic today uh, is uh, educational leadership and managing change in unprecedented uh, times. Uh, before we start, I would like to move uh, to my fellow panelists and ask them if possible to tell us more about the roles and what they do as, their, as leaders in today's educational uh, environment. Um, who would like to start? Uh, I can see Nilay. Nilay, would you like to start? Um, let me just understand the question very clear. What is my role in my, in my current job? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, um, I'm the CEO of Bloom Education. Uh, I manage currently four schools, and three of them are Brighton Colleges across Abu Dhabi, Alain, and Dubai. There's also another school, which is a, their English National Curriculum Schools. One more school we have in Dubai on the same campus is a IB Curriculum School. And I have six schools that are deli delivering the American curriculum for their charter schools for the government of Abu Dhabi. Basically, these schools are, um, it's the vision of Abu Dhabi to deliver high quality education at an affordable price. My role is to ensure that these are sustainable businesses and that the students make the progress and the attainment. Uh, and also um, yeah, ensure the sustainability of the organization. I'm not gonna go into the depth because I'm sure you're gonna ask a lot more questions. How did we manage this during the pandemic? So um, that's overall my role currently. Um, so it's the, it, 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 it is a business at the end of the day. So it's like any other business, you focus on the top line and you focus on the bottom line. Because if you don't get that equation correct, then you don't have sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. So that, in a that nutshell, is, that's what I do. That is, that is very true. Thank you very much, Nilay. Uh, Barrett, would you like to uh, tell us more about your current role and what you do? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I'm, I'm the CEO of the Middle East and European Division for the International Schools Partnership. The International Schools Partnership is a global organization that owns roughly 52, well, it owns 52 schools uh, across 10 different countries. Um, we, as, as the CEO, my responsibility is to run a team of regional experts who are there to support our schools within our divisions and uh, also support the principals in their day-to-day -day affairs. Our overall ambition and vision for the organization is to create schools of choice in uh, their local catchment by delivering on an amazing learning experience for our children and also uh, to support our staff in uh, doing the same thing. Great, thank you very much for, for sharing Bharat. And uh, Nada, can you tell us more about your current role and your involvement in the university? Hi, uh, my name is Nada Museke. Um, so glad to be with you this afternoon. Um, so um, I, I've been working with uh, New York University Abu Dhabi for the past nine years. And for those of you who don't know NYU Abu Dhabi, um, it's, you know, uh, one of the unique uh, models in higher education, I would say. It combines uh, liberal arts education, uh, supporting, you know, currently around 1800 undergrad, uh, but also it's a research university. Um, and it supports like 300 plus faculty um, in various research endeavors, uh, spanning from the STEM fields to the arts, um, uh, you know, creative, filmmaking. So it's quite interesting in terms of what it brings to the picture. And unlike my fellow colleagues here, uh, um, we're fortunate um, that, you know, we get the support from the government of Abu Dhabi. So like the front line, bottom line is not so much of an issue, but there are like so many other issues uh, relating to, uh, you know, making sure that we have good governance, that we are good steward of the funding that we receive. Um, so my role um, in the university is to oversee um, the research administration and financial planning for all academic program. Um, so I oversee research administration over the life cycle. So that's from the pre-award, from the time, you know, like we, we have ideas about what research we want to conduct, then how do we fund those research program? Um, how do we report back to the sponsors uh, on uh, you know, the research activities and the research output? Um, and that also have the, uh, you know, the student perspective. So I oversee the undergraduate research um, component uh, and the uh, student fellowship, which provide fellowship for students to do research after they graduate. Um, 
so yeah, that's in a nutshell my role, and I'm very happy to be with you this afternoon. Uh, perfect. So as you saw, we've got uh, very diverse backgrounds with all leadership roles in education and higher education related uh, institutions. So uh, we're going to have a great, great talk today. So speaking of unprecedented unprecedented times, uh, let's start with, with the first questions. Um, how do you think the recent situation has changed um, leadership in education? Um, Nada, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I think like, uh, you know, what we have witnessed as, you know, uh, administrator leaders over the past like year and a half, it's not even two years, but it feels like eternity, is something that we probably have not witnessed and will never witness in, in the near future or in our lifetime, maybe our kids' lifetime. Um, and and I was, we were discussing like a few minutes before the session I started, like, um, I think like what we will learn and what we have learned is something that we will cherish all our life. Um, I guess from my side is, uh, you know, how do you manage that, that turbulent change that came you know, right in March 2020, we woke up one day and the next day we couldn't go to, uh, to the office. Uh, how do you manage like moving uh, all the courses online, uh, teaching and learning? Um, and I remember we were talking about, okay, Shanghai, uh, our campus in Shanghai moving online, but that, you know, Abu Dhabi, like we're far like from Shanghai and we can like, just like, you know, move on and do what we need to do. We're busy trying to, uh, put together the celebration for our 10th anniversary. Uh, but then before you know it, it hit. And, you know, we were prepared, but not so prepared. And I think what really, you know, one thing that really mattered is communication, uh, transparent and honest communication from day one was, was key uh, because people appreciate to know what was happening so that they can also support uh, all the changes that are needed uh, to be made and all the, um, you know, adapting to the new models uh, of, of delivery uh, without disrupting, uh, you know, the, the delivery of all the programs um, and making sure we continue. It was not an easy ride, but it was something that we learned a lot from. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nala. Definitely communication and transparency played a very important role in, in managing, managing these changes. Um, Nilay, would you like to, to add and follow up yeah. on the question? Well, yes, I'd like to add to that. Before um, managing an education sector, I worked in many different industries. In all of those industries, we, we look at risk management. We think of different scenarios. What happens if there is a war? What happens if a plane dropped? What we do a lot of if scenarios. And we actually simulate. And, what I, and I mean, I'm used to this, but when I came into this sector, it's never done. And it was never done in this part of the world either. So I didn't do it. So that's one thing I've learned. You know, you've got to <laughs> ensure that you always um, be, have your creative ideas on how do you manage risk, should it happen. So when the pandemic did happen, yes, it was a shock to all of us. Um, I think you have to be resilient. Very, uh, you have to have definitely clear, crystal clear communication and transparency. And I think you've got to show people that there is light at the end of the dark tunnel and you've got to bring them along with you. So, um, yeah, I mean, I can go into many stories. I mean, the teachers became all MIT savvy. Uh, we, we, <laughs> you would never be able to make them such an IT savvy people if it was with CPDs that you deliver, you know? It was, um, and the other thing, you, you had to change, you, you, it was being resilient, it was being creative, it was saying that, you know, 80% is good enough. We've just got to get on, get on with it, deliver it, and then we refine it and we change it along the way. 
So I think the agility of the organization is very important. So whenever you develop a culture in your organization, you have to make sure that it's flexible and it's agile. So people are adaptable to quickly change. Listen to your people, align them, and yeah, communicate to them. Show them that there is a tunnel at the end of the star road. Great, thank you. Again, another emphasis on, on, on clear communication and definitely resilience and, and uh, agility. So Barrett, what's, what's your take on this? No, I think uh, Nada and uh, Nilea have both talked about and mentioned some very key points here. I just want to add one bit, which is, you know, chaos, disruption, um, whether you talk about the pandemic, um, you know, in my past life, you know, the 2008 financial crisis, you know, all these things happen and it's inevitable. Um, but I think what Nada and Nile were kind enough to, to, to raise here was there are some key things that any leader has to do. A leader should provide leadership for that situation. And what that means is you have to take stock of what's going on. What are the variables that are either not in your control? What are the variables that are in your control? You need to lead from the front, so you naturally, you know, you can't, uh, you have to prevent an overreaction from either the organization or from your stakeholders. You have to keep them calm. You have to be optimistic. That's the light at the end of the tunnel that Nile is talking about. And you have to also be realistic because there are things that are not in your control. Um, but you also have to be brave to make some very difficult dis uh, decisions. You know. You may know only 80%, but as a leader, you have to predict, you have to uh, look at history, and you have to move forward. And the real world requires practical solutions. They don't require theoretical solutions. Theoretical solutions can take forever and may be idealistic, but it's just not possible in the given time or in the environment. Uh, and I think bringing all of this together requires agility, requires nimbleness, um, and as many stakeholders you can bring on the table together, uh, that's by effective communication, I think the more buy-in you will have from the organization and everybody that gets affected by that organization. Great. Uh, valuable points and insights that you've shared with us, uh, uh, Barrett, and it actually moves us nicely to our next question. And, and I think in your answer, you really identified the role of a leader in, 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 in situations of, of disruptions. Um, so Nada, Nilay, how would, how would you uh, describe the roles of leaders in, in these situations, total disruption, similar situations? You know, uh, a good leaders are really the ones to demonstrate the three E's, right? You envision, you empower, you energize, you execute, you enable. So all these are very important when you are leading uh, an organization. Um, you will be resilient. You have to listen to your people. I think you have to explain always the why and not what we're doing. You know, and so you bring people along with you. My biggest challenge was financially when I was running the schools during the pandemic, because you've got a workforce who's working who wants to be rewarded, who wants to earn their salaries. And when the parents are losing their jobs and when they tell you, I cannot pay, and um, you, you, you need those revenues to be able to pay the salaries. So, my biggest challenge was that because in some of our schools we had the bring your own device so it was very easy to switch to teams or zoom and um, move on with the distance learning and you have to be realistic you know why you are you want to deliver the best quality education under those circumstances you have to be realistic and say this is the best we can do and then we improve it all along the way but financial was the biggest problem I had because, I, I mean, I know many institutions cut their salaries and don't forget these teachers are working hard and they're working in very diff difficult circumstances. Distance learning, I mean, the well-being of staff 
you have to take care of them. Just imagine if you cut their salary on top of all the difficulties that they had to do to deliver. So I went out there and for the first time in my life, I did, I did manage to get funds. It was a 52 million that I got from the ADFT funds. Uh, I was very, very resilient, you know, I didn't give up. I had to, I showed all our financials and that really helped me to pull the organization through because I did not cut salaries during the pandemic when people are working very hard. Yeah, so um, again, it's the three E's in any leadership, in any organization that you need. It's not different in the education sector. Great, great insights, uh, Neil. Thank you. Yeah, uh, especially when it came to salaries in our company, when the pandemic happened, our first aim was how we can manage without affecting anyone's salary. So I think sometimes by putting people first, it also uh, adds a different dimension and a direction to, to, to leaving the, the situation. Yeah, and Nada, on the same question about um, the role of leaders in, in, in these situations, uh, if you can add your points and also uh, by uh, identifying the challenges that leaders uh, face as well, that would be that would be great. I couldn't agree more with the light on, on like uh, the financial difficulties and the challenges that organizations face and, and the role of transparency um, in like making sure people understand what's happening. I mean, I know like there's a limit to how much you can share. But I found from our own experience that like when people understand why you're doing what you're doing, they tend to, um, you know, at least understand, they might not be very happy, but they understand uh, the impact of, the, of those changes on the organization. But I wanna tackle the angle of, of care for people, um, which I found is something that, uh, you know, became very apparent. And, and what I mean by care is true and general care. Like we all had to live like a really difficult situation. I had like people from my team members who like, you know, lost uh, parents to COVID, uh, uh, you know, who couldn't see their, you know, their kids. Uh, they didn't know when they would see them. I'm mean, one of them as well. Uh, so, I mean, creating that, that genuine sense of care and uh, understanding that situation changed, people are angry, people have grief, people, you know, all the emotions that were coming like to all of us, we're all in it together. I think that was really important and also showing flexibility. So when people like are not comfortable coming, you know, joining the Zoom call that day, because they were, you know, like sometimes it was just their mental health was impacted. Like knowing that it's okay and that you understand was really important uh, because otherwise, you know, they, they can't deliver the second day. We were all in it together. And maybe like, I will talk a little bit more about, you know, our experience in dealing with this and how, you know, creating that true sense of community, that team spirit, helped us move through like really difficult time, both on a personal level because we were all impacted, but also on an organizational level. Uh, so that, and, and I'm happy to see, I was reading like uh, some of the literature on, you know, leadership post COVID, the time of change, what we have learned. And I'm really happy to see that empathy is coming as a concept uh, way more and in way more, um, you know, way than uh, before. So people are recognizing that leaders have to be empathetic. They have to, you know, truly care for uh, their teams, others, uh, so that, you know, people can manage that turbulent change and be in it together. Well, yes, I could. just adding to that, people are your biggest assets. Yeah. No matter, yeah. you know, what organization yeah. you have. So. Absolutely. I think... Uh... I can really relate to that and I, uh, and I can see across not just uh, organizations, but nations and countries uh, leading with empathy definitely plays an important role in, in, in managing any sort of disruption and to be able to uh, make it better with clearer communication and um, really uh, explaining the whys, why, why are we doing this? Why, why this change is happening and how we can tackle it. Uh, 
very important points. Thank you for, sh thank you for sharing. Um, I think during our conversation, one of the topics that came up was digital transformation. And I think this was a topic that has been around for quite some time, but I think the recent changes uh, accelerated uh, this type of uh, transformation in a speed that was not expected and, and people were not uh, ready for. How quickly do you think leaders responded to uh, digital transformation? If you can share experiences in your organizations. Bharat, would you like to start? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, you know, you would think that the pandemic um, was in itself a, uh, a big shock to our sector. Um, I mean, you know, just to give you context, with 50 schools, 52 schools across the world, I had never imagined in any of my risk assessments that there would come a day when I would have no children on any campus at a single point in time. Uh, so, you know, you can do all your risk assessments, but the likelihood of that outcome happening is almost nil. Um, but, you know, uh, you, 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 you take the shock, you, 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 you then look around, you reflect, you see what's going on, um, you understand the waves, the global waves, and naturally, as you can all remember, you know, things were happening in the east, and then they were moving, shifting uh, quickly towards the west. Um, you know, you begin to learn from each other's experiences. You begin to uh, create a network uh, of like-minded people, people who are perhaps going through the same thing, people who are subject matter experts, people who, are, who have a common purpose of getting the learning restarted, so to speak. Um, so yeah, so, so we, we created plans uh, quickly and on the fly. And keep in mind, these plans were never you know, in stone. These were always evolving. They were always being updated. But you know, the first and most of the first actions included, of course, increasing bandwidth, putting in resources in the hands of our teachers, in the hands of our parents and students so that they could access the learning. Because our ultimate goal, and you know, We've all touched upon this during when we were introducing ourselves, was to ensure that the students in our organizations were constantly or were continuously learning and learning at levels uh, that will achieve the progress and the attainment that we desire for them. So getting them the access was, I think, our first most critical thing. Uh, then we wanted to make sure that it was in a safe environment. So whether there was a protocol for digital safety, how to use your access, how to use your devices, training them making sure our teachers are trained, making sure our parents are trained, making sure our students are trained to access that education, ensuring that our staff were looking up, being looked after, that their well-being was not being impacted, being at home, you kind of, the, the, the lines between work and the home or work and after work sort of were being sort of watered away and you, know, you couldn't tell the difference when you were at work, when you weren't. Keep in mind, you know, we didn't have any work from home protocols then. Um, but it was a lot of working together, working with our parents, working with our regulators, working with our students, but keeping the child at the center of every decision making helps with that digital transformation. What to focus on with the limited resources that we had, with the limited time we had to get this going as quickly as possible, and then looking at transformation, looking at digital uh, online learning to be effective, to be efficient, to help deliver learning uh, at least at the same levels, if not even better. Mm. Very interesting point in getting the priorities right. So digital transformation is one angle of it, but what's the overall aim and objective? Uh, uh, really like that point. And, and Nada, how would you like to, to add to this? I mean, I, I would tackle this from slightly different angle, like in, Coming up with creative uh, solution, um, I mean, my experience is supporting uh, research more than teaching and learning. Maybe I can share, like, you know, one or two examples and how we, uh, you know, it's not like research cannot be digital, but you still have to do research. I mean, you cannot just keep the labs and uh, and the fish tanks without uh, feeding the fish. Uh, but uh, you know, one of the you know, major um, challenges we faced was researchers in social science, they rely a lot on 
uh, you know, people doing the field work. So they had to hire uh, RAs and, uh, you know, researchers to support them do their research. And of course, with all the bans on travel, the fact that we had hiring freeze, so everything came to a standstill, like, you know, they literally couldn't do uh, anything. And, you know, bear in mind that faculty are on tenure track. So like if they lose one year of research, they technically could lose their career. Uh, so we had to come up with creative solution. And one of the solution was like, okay, let's see how we can still engage the people they want to work with, but they can work from wherever they are, like in the world, like so doing like research in Africa or, uh, you know, in, in Nepal. So we can, you know, just create a, an external engagement where they can do the work. Uh, we can take the, the checks and balances for like, you know, uh, all the financial, financial and regulatory matters for engaging those people and they can still do the work. So, uh, you know, we had to like act quick um, you know, come up with, uh, you know, contract template, work was legal. And before we know it, like, you know, we had literally hundreds and hundreds of engagement that we processed in four months. Um, and that was seen very positively by faculty because, you know, they could continue doing what their research, doing what they're doing. And, um, you know, at the same time, also, we provided some employment opportunity for people where, you know, uh, financially were in distress. Uh, so that was like a win-win uh, situation. A great experience, Anala. Thank you for sharing. Nilay, what would you like to add? Well, I think... Um... I agree with, I think I experienced what Baharat experienced in his school. Just adding on to that, all over a sudden, there were so many IT apps that, you know, the solutions for everything, which you've never heard of. You know, they all appeared. But I think the challenge was um, finding um, <clears throat> integrated solutions. So initially we started people forgetting their passwords, many passwords. And as you went along and you got better single sign-ons, again, you had financial difficulty because in some schools, not all students have devices. So what we did, we had a bus and we prepared all these books and homeworks. And literally the bus was dropping them off to the houses and collecting the, dropping them off one day, beginning of the week and collecting them at the end of the week until all the devices were distributed to these children. So you have to be very creative on how do you ensure that the students are making progress? Yeah. So um, yeah. I, think, I think everything else was can, 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 can I just add one more point? Can I just add one more point? There are organizations out, out there that um, you know, when, you're, when, you're, when you're stuck, uh, when a customer comes to you with a problem, you know, they just don't have the solutions. Well, you know, in the education sector with schooling and with university, I think we're in a non-compromising situation. You know, um, we cannot afford to compromise on our students' learning. And I think that makes, that, that, that really puts us in a position of going above and beyond. Um, and as, an as, as a leader, as an educational leader, I think that is one of the key traits uh, the pressure that we're under, which is uh, we have to we have to strive for excellence in service, and if we can do that well, I think keeping that child and his and his or her learning at the forefront, I think uh, most of our decisions are already made for us. It's about then implementing those decisions. Thank you. Thanks again for for sharing your insights and experiences. Um, I would like to move to another question. So what do you think is the ultimate test of leadership? Was it the recent developments in, in, your, in your view? Bharat, do you, would you like to start as you were just touching on this? Yeah, um, it's, 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 you know, I, I talked about the existential threat to, you know, to our sector. And then you talk about the financial troubles, you know, parents losing jobs, um, you know, and especially in a market like the UAE, where you know, mostly expats have resulted in people leaving uh, or at least uh, hunkering down. Um, but now looking back, 
probably the only sector, well, besides technology, which has just risen all, during this whole period, that's seen an, that's seen a a quick V curve sort of a bounce back. Uh, UAE came out, KHA came out with a report that talked about you know six percent growth since September 2020 to December to January 2020, and uh, and 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 I believe the market has bounced back. I think. Uh, the ultimate test is to be able to find the right balance um, between what that uh, situation requires. Uh, it is to ask yourself and your stakeholders, what are their needs? Whether those are shareholders and it's economic profit or savings, whether it is the parent and the student and it is about continue, continuous learning, whether it is the regulatory body, whether it is uh, social distancing, safety, masks, it's about bringing out the best in your team and in your organization in terms of their effort. If you can maximize the output and the results for each of your stakeholders, I think you've done a good job. And then last but not least, I think I want to touch upon this also, is about getting better. It's about always evolving. Um, it's about always getting better. And I think we've all learned a lot of lessons uh, from this last situation. And I think the schools are more resilient and the schools are gotten a lot better than they used to be uh, pre-pandemic. Great, thank you. Thank you, Bharat. Uh, Nilay, what are your takes on the, the um, ultimate test of leadership? Yeah. I think Bharat explained it all, but I will add to that. You have to have a good strategic plan and you've got to be always forward looking. Just to add on to what Parat said. Thank you. Uh, Nada, your views. Yeah. I, I'll go back to the last first point on agility and flexibility. I think it's really important um, you know, to manage those crises. And I mean, in the higher education sector, I have to say there was one added crisis to the COVID and the financial and budget. There was the um, a systemic discrimination, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, Asian hate. And, I mean, we had to deal with this right in the middle of like everything else that was happening. We had to give answers to students, to faculty. Uh, students were asking about you know, curriculum. They were asking about like representation and you had to give all those answers. You had to deal with like, I was reading that article and say like, okay, if you have one crisis, you can deal with it too you might you know manage but three like it will knock you down so when you have three and you don't have an uh, you know agile uh, leadership and you don't have uh, you know the strategic vision and the, the flexibility of changing um, you know the strategic objective to to fit to the situation i don't think you know it, you know I, I think it would be challenging for organization to survive yeah I mean, during this time, I've run so many town hall meetings with our staff saying we're all in it together. Let's put our minds together. Let's work together. I think it's that teamwork, it's that collaboration, it's that clarity, it's that empowering your people to make decisions. Um, we're in it all together and there is a way we're going to get out of it. So I think it's just been very resilient. Yeah. No, absolutely. We're all in it together is definitely a key takeaway when all the stakeholders are on the same boat. They definitely have a better okay. understanding and more empathy about the different people in the role. So while communicating each other's situation, there's there's definitely a better, better understanding. You, you, you mentioned, uh, uh, Nilay, about uh, staff and town hall meetings. Uh, I guess one of the key challenges during these times have been like keeping teams motivated and engaged. Uh, yeah. How can leaders go ahead uh, and support staff and team motivation? Uh, would you like to start? Can you like? Uh, okay. You have to empower people as you manage them. You've got to listen to them. You have to listen to their ideas. You have to reward them. They have to know that there will be a reward at the end of this because uh, it, it's not easy, it's tough times. Um, we had to enable them. I, I think it was more listening, working as a team. team teamwork became very important. Um, 
What else did we do? Basically, listening to everyone and trying to find a solution. And there is a solution for everything. It's like the mentality of, if you want something, there's always a way of getting it. And then let's, let's run these workshops. Let's listen to ideas. And at the end of the day, it's all about alignment because once you align to the organization, you are able to achieve the outcome you are looking for. Great. Def definitely an interesting point about listening because we, we touched on communication and communication is a two-way road and part of it is also un listening to the ground and understanding everyone's challenges. And Neda, what's your thoughts on uh, motivation and engagement? Yeah, same. I think, uh, you know, teamwork was something that, uh, you know, became more and more important. And, you know, I want to share like a, an example. Uh, so, um, I mean, I, I run like maybe four different teams. I mean, they all work in research administration, but they're like, you know, separate teams. So physically, when we were in the office, it was not possible because they're 25 to put them in one room. Uh, but then like the first week when we went online, I thought like, you know, we have the opportunity to bring everyone online. So we decided like Thursday, 10, 10 a.m., we have that meeting and everyone is in, like everyone. Um, and it was like, you know, transformative, I have to say, you know, having everyone in even one Zoom room, uh, not only like from the work perspective was really, really beneficial because they all work through the life cycle of a grant. So having them, you know, talk together, solving problems relating to one grant where before we used to solve them in different groups was, uh, you know, very, very beneficial from the work perspective, but also from, you know, building that team spirit uh, perspective. So it was not just a meeting to talk about work. We would spend like maybe half the meeting just talking about what's happening, the election, how do we feel, you know, what are the changes that, you know, are impacting all of us. Sometimes, you know, nag about like the fact that, you know, the Dubai Abu Dhabi border were closed, how many COVID tests, vaccination, I mean, silly stuff, but they were like so important to bring the community together to create that spirit. And when I first saw the team, maybe after a year and a half, I swear I could see a different dynamic. I could see people who I never thought they would become like friends, became real friends. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that was so powerful. Um, and I think it created like bonds that, you know, will last way after, uh, you know, this whole thing. So that was like really, really uh, transformative. And I, I'm, I'm glad I was part of it. It was not like planned, we didn't plan it this way, but we did this meeting religiously every week, every Thursday throughout the past year and a half. We never missed one meeting. Uh, so that was really, really important. Great, thank you for, for, for sharing. Uh, Bharat, your experience on managing different teams and, and the motivational aspect. Yeah, um, you know, you guys touched upon the key points. Um, I love, uh, you know, it, it was all about connecting. It was, you know, we lost a way of connection when we went um, into our homes and we couldn't see each other in the workforce. Um, and I think that's the same thing that our students uh, experienced, that's the same thing, you know, all of us experienced in our own versions. I think it was the connection that we lost. So we wanted to bring that connection back with uh, online learning and, you know, in other ways. And I think it was helpful to have our teams buy in to what we were trying to solve here. Once you make them part of a solution, you get them engaged. Then you train them, you develop them, you give them the resources. Then they get motivated because then they can do something more than they could do before. We got them motivated, we got them engaged by training them, by connecting with them, by making them part of the solution. And we got some amazing, amazing ideas from people. And that level of commitment to the greater cause of
experience do we have? Um, what did we learn from the, the current situation? If you would like to share example, your own personal and organizational uh, examples. And Nada, would you like to start? Yeah, um, I think like everything we talked about uh, so far. So communication, uh, transparent communication, uh, empathy, but also genuine empathy. So I'm, I'm emphasizing on some like words because I think like people start, like they can distinguish between like genuine empathy or transparent, real transparent communication and communication that just ticks the boxes. And we have to have like five time rules and six of that. So, you know, I think people, because of having lived through what we all lived through, uh, they, they can distinguish that. And that's really important. And I hope that leaders recognize this. So we learned it in, you know, all the management books, we even teach it to the student, but I don't know how much um, organizations uh, were implementing all those, uh, you know, principles. Um, and I hope that with what we have seen, with what, you know, everyone shared experience of the impact that this could have on people and organization, that those will have lasting changes moving forward. Yes, I definitely hope so too. Uh, Barrett, your, your view on what we've learned. Yeah. Yes, this was a great moment of uh, introspection. I think if you step back and you see what, have, what, what, what happened over the last uh, few years, you'd say that you know, we're large, we're still a global united world. We have more things in common than differences. We all went through the same challenges, similar challenges. We, 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 we were all affected professionally to an extent, personally to an extent, some more than others. Um, but I think what came out of this yet again from any challenge that you've seen in history is that uh, we unbundled and we unwrapped the way we were doing certain things and it's created an opportunity to find how to do the same things but in a better way. I think that's the spirit of innovation that you know, we probably haven't touched upon but I think this was a great um, sort of trigger or instigator for in innovation. And you know, we talked about the apps. Apps are just one element of innovation, but you know, there's so much more that's going on in our schools and in our businesses. You know, the way we run our processes, the way we run some of our systems, the way we deal with recruitment, the the, the way we deal with digital um, learning, um, even just facilities, and and the way we're going to use our facilities going forward. There's going to be ways to innovate all these different sectors, all these different businesses, all these different aspects. Um, and, you know, what better way to do it by working together and finding better ways, you know, of living our lives. Great, great observation, Bart, and, and definitely one key takeaway in any situation, even, you know, hardship, uh, disruption, mm -hmm. is we come out of it stronger. As you said, innovation plays a key part, and now there's, it's opened minds and and businesses, organizations, countries are looking at it from a fresh perspective. And that has led to a lot of innovation in, 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 in various industries. Uh, Nilay, uh, would you like to, to end our okay. session with your, boy, your, your views on, on the lessons? Okay, I will that. I agree with everything what you have said. Emotional intelligence, empathy, working all together forward-looking, thinking about integrated solutions as we move along. These are all important things. But what we've learned is digitalization is a tool. It can't take away what a quality teacher can do. Yeah, it can't, and the connection is important. So even if in the future there's gonna be online learning, They've got to get the right combination between the synchronous, asynchronous, and actually physical, physically meeting together. Otherwise, we will not succeed. Because what we've learned is that parents now, parent engagement was wonderful during the pandemic. Everybody has parent engagement as their KPIs every year. You know, how do we 
engage with parents more, they know about their child. Actually, parents learned about their child. They, they, they understood where their child level is and the difficulty and all the efforts that the school puts in. So that was, uh, that was good. That, uh, everyone gained a point in a parent engagement. But also uh, speaking with parents and making them understand, you know, people were not happy with distance learning when they had to understand the technology you had and work with you. So it wasn't only working with the organization and aligning with them to come through these difficult times, but we also had to work with the parents, with the students, and they had to understand our capabilities. But at the end of the day, the focus is all about high quality education. So you've got to deliver that excellence in education in whatever you do. And when there is a way, when there is a will, there is always a way. And you work with your teams and you just get it done. Yeah, absolutely. I can definitely relate uh, to the parent engagement side, having two boys in online education and going through the first week especially <laughs> with an eight-year-old uh yeah so yeah i can definitely relate to that uh yeah thank you thank you for for mentioning you know not undermining the quality as a key point in any sort of disruption and and, uh, and by having that as a focus as as barrett also pointed out uh by setting those priorities uh and as neda you mentioned bringing in the organization uh, having that clear communication and transparency and being empathetic, empathetic that all helps us uh, go through any sort of uh, challenge in and especially uh, unprecedented times. Uh, well, I would like to thank the esteemed panelists. I definitely learned a lot from your experiences and the University of Manchester for this chance. And uh, Heba, over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Cameron. Thanks, Nila and Nada uh, with, and uh, Bharat. We'd like to open the session now for your questions. And Stop as I since I have a last word as well, I would also like to thank all the participants as well for, for patiently waiting and then uh, uh, joining us on this session. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. So do we start with the Zoom room or we start from here? Any questions? No questions is usually a good sign that they've been. Uh, <laughs> covered the talks were, everything's covered. Yeah, it's very interesting. Very absolutely, absolutely. I think we covered uh, leadership from all points, all the challenges that you faced and how you responded to them. Um, we do can I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Please. Yeah, can I? Can I? If if you don't mind, I'd love to ask the students a question. I'd love to learn. Um, what was it that they admired the most from their leadership during the pandemic? Um, and what was it that they could have done better? Can you just repeat your question? Sorry, what was it that the, yeah, what was it that the students admired the most uh, during the pandemic when the university was closed? Um, and what was it that they would have liked to be, you know, Better. So, did you understand? What did they? What did the students admire most? And what did and they? What could the university do better? What could the university do better? The university or the school? What did they admire the most when it went on? When it closed? And what can they do better? The university okay. can do but better. These students are also working professionals. Is this question is this as to their experience on the program as students or as working professionals in their school or both? Well, um, it's, it's open. It's, 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 it could be leaders in the, in, in, in the workplace or it could be leaders uh, at, the, you know, at the university. But I, I, will ask, I will ask the one question there. Do you know, working from home made me think, because we have a headquarters, <laughs> right? We have a shared services when we're managing all schools. Why should I pay all this rent I said to myself? <laughs> yes. I, I can put that money back into the quality of education. I only need a meeting room 
once in a while where I have to go and meet my people once a week. We're working in teams very effectively and efficiently. So for me, it was a you know, saving opportunity to say, you don't really need big rooms and you can balance it out. Maybe two days at work or three, day, three days at work and work from home. So that's what I would like to say. Diana wants to talk. Diana. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm from the Middle East Center and I'm in the second year of uh, MALA program. Um, if I have to recall back 2020 when I was um, working towards getting enrolled in this program, I would say that it was so nice and so great to see the welcoming um, attitude of the university members and had worked in team from Middle East to Manchester, UK, and how things were done in a very, very organized way. And we all had, I mean, um, I especially, I would say, I'm not quite sure about others, but everything was very, very well settled as I see it from then and now. And then there was such a quick uh, drop in the fee structure, which was so, um, so accommodating, I would say, that you thought of the entire, whether, whether we got cuts in our salaries or not as teachers and um, uh, were working in different places, but still you still realized and had such a broad perspective on the whole scenario, the whole pandemic that was, uh, that, that we all had, uh, we were all hit by. So um, I think it was very, very positive to see, not just at school level, but also uh, leadership uh, at university level had worked, um, I think, worked towards us, uh, including us in everything. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Diana. Can, can I add one thing? So I, I, I think one like aspect like we didn't really cover is the importance of uh, providing support, mental, emotional support for staff, faculty, and students. I think this became uh, more obvious during the past uh, the past year and a half. Um, and you know, I think institution went like a long way in providing that support, at least like so first talking about it because we never talked about it. We never talked about the need for um, emotional, uh, providing, providing emotional support and mental health support through various forums like online, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, like during the pandemic, I think this became more obvious. Organization did a lot. And I hope they will continue to do this after because that's an ongoing challenge that um, you know all of us. So we provided mental health support for students, but then we didn't realize that staff and faculty needed this. And, and it only took that big pandemic to open those programs uh, to the whole community. Um, and it was really well received. Um, I think people appreciated that support. Um, and I hope it will continue. I mean. That's, that's my take. Yeah. But uh, just to answer your question, uh, our students, they're all working professionals. So they're working and they're studying at the same time. And the format of our programs is blended learning. So it's a blend of online study and uh, on-campus attendance. And even during the pandemic, when everything went online, we tried our best to deliver the best quality of this program. So we facilitated hybrid work hybrid sessions, like the ones we're running now at this uh, hotel. Mm -hmm. So uh, even when faculty weren't able to come and travel to attend the teaching part of the program uh, from Manchester in Dubai, uh, we were facilitating classrooms for the students to come and attend the programs while broadcasting sessions live uh, from Manchester where faculty were presenting. We also had alumni who were teaching assistants in the program and they were facilitating and helping and guiding students. We also supported students uh, following up on Nada's uh, uh, point. We had webinars and sessions on mental health well-being. Uh, we all, the staff of the university, we became mental health first aiders. So we supported our students on one-to-one -one level um, and that's uh, the many things that we, we've done, you know, at the university level. Uh, that sounds great. That sounds great. We did similar programs to our parents as well. How to help them in distance learning, mental health being. So that we run webinars to our parents. That's great. Any more questions from the Zoom room from here? 
Well, with that, I think it's I think time. There's a question out there. Is there somebody out there? Around yes, Mark. Hi. Would uh, you? Yeah, of course. Please. Uh, I have a question for Barat. Uh, I just want to turn the question around a little bit on Barat. Can I ask you to come here sure. so that you can speak to the camera? Um, Where do you want me? You, <laughs> you can stand here and go there. All right. Okay. I know it's quite a bit tricky to so just. Okay. Uh, hi, Barat. Uh, this question is for you. Um, I just wanted to, um, uh, first of all, my name is Mark, Mark Graham. Uh, I am uh, an alumni of um, Manchester Business School. And I've also been here this week helping out with the International Business Strategy course. Um, my question is, how has the culture at your organization, ISP, how has the culture changed uh, in the last two years as a result of the pandemic? And also, what, what do you think the leadership of your organization could have done better during that period? All right, so you've taken mine, you've twisted it around, and then you've just thrown it back at me. No, but it's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, you know, <laughs> um, you know we're, being, being, being a worldwide organization, um, we were... You know, we're very proud of saying, oh, we're worldwide, we're, we're present in 10 countries, you know, you have to take flights sometimes to South America to see colleagues, and we have all these fancy uh, off-sites globally. Uh, the pandemic actually got us closer. Um, we became more inclusive uh, in the way we thought, in the way we make decisions, in the way we arrive at decisions. Um, we held more sort of workshops, whether it was about reaction to or our reopening protocols. Uh, we held more workshops around uh, mental and uh, mental health and well-being for our students, for our staff. Uh, yes, we had uh, several more discussions when it came to you know health and safety. but all of these conversations allowed us to get to know each other better. It allowed us to find strengths in areas that we wouldn't have expected. And um, I think as an organization and individual and every individual, we're able to create more um, stronger relationships with people that they probably even hadn't seen face to face. Um, I think that was, that was sort of, uh, I think, something that we've, um, we've actually cherished during this time. We have come back to work. I mean, you know, we in fact came back quite early. And I think what we had, what we could do better is we need to find and figure out a new way of normal. Are we working from home? Are we working uh, from work? Are we still going to maintain those relationships that we fostered during the pandemic? Are we still going to be inclusive, vertically, horizontally? Um, how inclusive? Uh, are we still going to continue these practices that, in, that, that, that gave us such uh, rewarding um, results for those specific challenges we were facing during the pandemic? Can we make that part of a bigger process? Um, you know, we, we conducted surveys, we conducted, you know, I talked about workshops. Some of these things were good. And some of these things, of course, sometimes, you know, you get, uh, you get, you get, you get death by like, you know, just meetings. Um, it's about finding the new normal and i think we can do better about you know trying to focus on the good and seeing what's the right balance did that answer your question it does thank you <laughs> thank you Vera. thank you so much um if we have no more we have one more question from noble um it's 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 for everyone just um i've seen um means being a, being, a, being, a, being a father and I've seen parents still having fear of getting back to, uh, getting children back to school and into the regular routine and they are still adopting. Some are still opting for a full online learning session because of the fear of COVID and has leaders and taking into the full team into account, how do we pass on a message of, of, of and encouraging parents to bring back children, regardless of what regulatory authorities are saying that the capacity of schools has to be this, uh, online learning has to be ended, uh, has to be stopped by this date. 
But from what I've been observing through my personal circle, I still feel that there are quite a good portion, um, percentage of parents fearing to get children back, their own kids back into school. So how, how, how do we go about the situation as leaders and communicating this message down to parents? Um, I can tell you what we're doing. Um, in some of the schools, we're blessed because everybody wants to come back. So what we did, we created even extra places. We've read and created classrooms so that we can observe the one meter distance and allow everyone to come back. In other schools, some parents do not want to come back, but we gave them the choice until January. And then in January, they will come back. Now, I also have schools in the charter, this one is, where we ended up with around 400 extra enrollment in, in August, where we need to hire teachers in the pandemic. Now, we are an organization who opened the school in September 2020 during the pandemic, and we opened two new schools this academic year. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that it is very, very challenging to recruit and to bring staff over. We recruited staff who said, I don't want to be vaccinated. So they turned down the offer. But um, in those, I am telling them, please stay online until January because I need to recruit before I can take you back. And I also, we also need to buy desks and chairs so that we can keep the one meter um, distance and put the maximum number of students in the class because of the um, high numbers. Yes. But we are also encouraging them that they should be coming back in January. We, we send videos, we show them what we're doing. Um, I think it's, we invite them to teams, explain to them that it's very better for their child to come back. So we're doing every possible way for students to come back because I'm sure you will agree with me that distance learning wasn't the best for every child. So there is a gap to that attainment and everybody has, no matter how well we have delivered distance learning. It doesn't replace the classroom learning. But I, would you like to add on this? Yes, yes, I think uh, Nile, Nile, it, 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 it's exactly what she said. She said, you know, we've got to raise our standards of safety. We've got to make it the safest place for their children. And, you know, ultimately it's their decision. It's the parents' decision. And we're hoping that, you know, as organizations, we can help influence those decisions by making a place as safe, by sharing as much communication about the matter uh, that's relevant and that's, um, that's relatable to them. You know, um, there, is, there is a risk of losing um, the kind of learning that you can have on campus or in a school, social, face-to-face, -face, asynchronous learning, all these are risks that you carry when you choose to keep your child at home on, online. And then there are the risks of online learning, you know, uh, access to information online that is probably not relevant or uh, harmful to the child versus the risk of COVID. If I can maintain a high standard of COVID protocols, mask wearing, social distancing, vaccine inoculation across staff and students and entry, I'm, I'm reducing that risk. And then the cost benefit changes. You can get all the learning that you had in a classroom and in a school with much less risk. And it's that constant communication and understanding that we have to share with our parents uh, that will hopefully allow uh, for parents to come back or consider the child and their needs before they make that decision. And, and, and like Nile, you know, our schools have grown. They grew during the pandemic and they grew again. Um, some were on blended before, now most of them are um, providing in-school learning. Yes, we have fewer children in classrooms. We've got more classrooms, more teachers, uh, but as an environment, it's back to being you know, full of life and full of energy and enthusiasm. And you know, your child is missing out on an incredible experience. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bharat, for that. 
Um, I think if we have no more questions, we can now wrap up the session and say thank you. Thank you again, uh, everyone. Thank you, Nilay. Thank you, Nada, Barat, and also Kamran. Uh, it was a great session, great insights and knowledge that you shared today. We really appreciate that. Thank you, everyone who's joining us online and in person. And um, we, we hope that you've also enjoyed the session. We would love to invite you again on future events. So let's all stay tuned to that. Thank you very thank much. You. And with this, I will say good night. And thank um, you, everyone. Cameron, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Um,